Welcome to the 2021 edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 638. I'm Ah Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's January 5th, 2021. All right, welcome to our first program of 2021. You guys have survived. Well, if you're watching this program, I'm assuming you're a survivor of 2020. I should have made t-shirts. You know, I survived 2020 with Kevin and George, something like that. But uh, uh, what a long year. Uh, this year purports to be just as interesting as we found that the uh, the Congress is now mocking God during their opening prayers. And uh, certainly, you know, stuff that is going to keep journalists like George and I working well long through the year. Um, why the long break, guys? We wanted to see you over Christmas, and we wanted a New Year's program. Well, George, as you know, is a full-time minister, working his tail off. And uh, other than Holy Week, I think the Christmas season is the busiest season for, for clergy. Am I right, George? Yes, this, week, this year Christmas fell on a Friday morning. Mm -hmm. And with online services, in-person services, the following Sunday, and the state of Florida allowed prison visitations for the first time that Christmas weekend and our local orphanage allowed visitations for the first time since March. So Saturday, you know, the Saturday after Christmas, I spent four hours in prison. On the Sunday after Christmas, after services were over, I went and spent the afternoon at our orphanage and on top of I don't know how many services I did, and we're allowed to do pastoral visits again. Busy time, so that I was, I slept that Sunday night 12 hours till Monday morning, um, and have basically been brain dead. Because at the same time, we're doing year ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to let, uh, my, vest, my warden and I agreed to let go uh, some members of our staff and hire new ones, and all the year end, uh, stuff is exciting and exhausting and you didn't want to see me uh, uh <laughs> last <laughs> week <laughs> well it gave me time to transition um jill and i are no longer in the rv this week we uh have been ignoring some good financial offers on the condo we own up in connecticut but we can't just say okay take it we actually have to do the process where we make it ready for sale and we take the highest offer we list it with the realtor so last week we raced up in one day drove from uh, um, orlando area all the way to milford which is really a, an 18 to 20 hour drive uh which is fun when you're when you're 18 but you when you're when you're 55 george it's a long drive oh, <laughs> and you know parts of it are real drag driving through washington driving around new york mm -hmm. city yeah I mean, no, uh, it, for us it was the Carolinas. There's, it's like a bottleneck every time we go through the Carolinas. There, everybody who's leaving Fl uh, Florida races into the Carolinas, and it's a traffic jam. Everybody who leaves uh, the Northeast and gets uh, below Virginia and hits that North Carolina line, and we're just watching cars go 20 miles an hour both ways, north and south. Hi, you're in for the whole trip? Yeah, I'm on full, full 20 hours. And so we got up here in three days. We were able to prep the house uh, for sale. Uh, it went on the market today. We're having nine showings, George. That's how the market has changed now that people are fleeing New York City. We are on a train stop. Uh, and we're an hour away from New York City uh, in the Milford train stop, hour 20 minutes. And people are like, yeah, we, we're out of New York. It's too dangerous now. We don't want to be in Manhattan. We don't want to be anywhere near the, the bureaus. And... Um, we are literally getting offers at 20 to 25 percent more than we did in november and i'm not going to just you know ignore those if somebody needs my property i'm willing to help george i am i'm here for you Lots well, of zeros kevin i think i think <laughs> i think what i'll do is i'll encourage you to be generous and all of our viewers you, if you do get a stimulus check from That's the right. government <laughs> consider passing it along to anglican on the script sure. we, uh, take donations. we need equipment we need travel money we need uh, well not oh, in COVID I... times now that's interesting 
The the only uh, show I recorded last year is I did the Anglicans for Life in D.C., uh, Alexandria, Virginia area, right, Virginia last year. I had no other shows because of um, COVID, the lockdown. And I, I got an email from Anglicans for Life, and I think there's things online this year. They're doing the, They're going to do it virtually with Zoom. They'll have the breakout meetings. I think they'll do a wonderful job, like they did before. Um, they're just they're adapting to the situation. Now, what I'm kind of finding when talking to people and uh, checking out forms and stuff like that is, there are going to be um, churches that are going to be strictly online uh, in the future. That they're making a ministry. They're they're they have this niche. They've understood the technology. They understood the needs of people in COVID times and not in COVID times so that they're going to survive when this is all over, even in a virtual sense. They don't have to have a building somewhere where people attend. How is that going to happen? Well, they're not going to be as liturgical as Anglicans are used to. But I think that they're going to offer all the services in in other ways, George. And um, how is that possible? We as humans adapt. It is. It's. It's so weird to see how uh, things adapt. And I'm going to use my wife as an example here. Jill uh, is a uh, senior project leader for a company here in the Northeast, and she likes to meet with people in conference rooms and and hash out ideas and get the projects going. And she likes the visual uh, interpretation. See when she says something, she wants to see your face to see if you're, you're listening or not. I know that because I'm her husband. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so she's been doing audible conference calls now since COVID hit and been working on the road. And she's slowly adapting. You know, I when I'm listening to I, he's not listening to me. You know, I know. God, he, it's like, <laughs> so she has adapted to a non-visual, complete audible, audible uh, conference calls. And that's the way humans do. When we're in a situation, um, and thanks be to God, we adapt. And uh, it's just, the, it's our nature. It's the way we were created. So I think churches, some, not a lot, will just exist virtually online. I th- am seeing hints of that in my own experience. We, uh, my parish, I do a daily Compline service, seven days a week, 10 o'clock at night, as well as the uh, three services in person on Sunday. And they're all outdoors, unless it's raining, then we move indoors and we're socially distanced with masks, but we're outdoors. Being in Florida, you can do that. And then we have uh, three uh, online services on Sunday. Morning prayer on Sunday has the same level of viewership as the 1030 choral service. And, And it has the same level of viewership as the 10 p.m. Compline service. So a seven minute service will draw as many viewers as the hour and a half service as the 15 minute service. Now what I'm seeing is that that 15 minute morning service and the seven minute evening service are drawing people from all across the the globe. Um, I pray for the sick and Right now, I'm praying for, and of the people send me the photo, I have praying for a woman from Toronto, one from Albuquerque, one from El Paso, another, I don't know where she's from, but she has osteomyelitis. Mm-hmm. Um, where I'm going is that the consistency of having these short uh, services has built a following. And the ve- for me, they're very structurally liturgical. There's no preaching, there's no music in the morning prayer or the Compline, but they're almost reassuring in that you have me in front of the altar, and if and I may have a read, lay reader record their little segment. But that, you know, from a marketing perspective, does just as well as my Holy Communion service mm-hmm. uh, in terms of viewership, and I'm not, and I'm trying to figure out how to do that. So, folks. If you want to see what I'm talking about, uh, go to my Facebook page. Uh, that's the fastest way to do it. Instead of trying to remember the name of the church, just look up George Conger, and you'll see I post I post that on face my own personal Facebook Facebook page, and you well, can enter the world that way. Well, that's the the interesting thing here is you're no longer an Episcopal priest in Lacanto, Florida. 
um, the internet and virtual church and virtual worship allows you to be the Episcopal preach, uh, uh, priest in everywhere. Hooterville, Florida. Hooterville, <laughs> you know, uh, in Washington, in every country available where where the internet exists, you are there. It's you know, it's it's kind of that final chapter we fulfill. Go, you know, go into all the world. Well, guess what? We're there. <laughs> we we have finally, you know, for all intents and purposes, reached the the entire world as asked for by by Christ. Now, in and and part of, part of it is is playing to your strengths. I've mm-hmm. always had what they call a radio voice. Mm-hmm. Kevin, you actually were a radio I disc was jockey. A, was, it was a radio voice. <laughs> but you and I have good voices for uh, we we have good oral quality. I'm not a good singer. I'm not an entertainer. But a Compline service where it's me speaking the words of the service, or where you and I are speaking to each other. Um, those are our, if you will, performing strengths. And so my particular performing strengths of my voice and sort of my priestly presence works. If I tried to play the guitar or if I tried to, uh, uh, you know, be Joel Osteen or something and get all sparkly clean teeth and everything, it wouldn't work. So it, it, it's interesting to see how the Lord uses different talents and gifts people have. Mm-hmm. And it's not that these are competitive gifts, but they're complementary gifts because they all work towards the same purpose, which is bringing people into fullness of relationship with Jesus Christ. I used to get very jealous because I would have members of my congregation say, we watched your service, and then we watched this service because we love the music, and then we watched that service because we love that aspect of it. And in essence, they're picking and choosing those things that as a package fill them with uh, uh, fills their need for companionship and fellowship in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And if I can be a part of that package, that's wonderful. I I guess I can't be all things to all people. Uh, But you can be part of the problem. Most little most most church pastors want to be all things to all people. But we can't. But you can be part Especially of Especially online, we can. I think virtually online, within six months to a year, we're going to have a la carte services. You know, mm-hmm. where you're going to get to choose your music, choose your preacher, choose your liturgy, and that is not too far away. You know, we have a vaccine, we have hope down the future, but we're still in high lockdown. England, especially. Uh, the UK is still in lockdown. France, they want to re lockdown. Italy is locked down here, not locked down here, locked down here. Um, it's strange. Florida, no lockdown. Florida, no, yeah, no lockdown. No, no lockdown. I can, and that was so weird. We came all the way up here from Florida, and I had to, you know, we came, also came for our doctors and dentist appointments. So Dr. Watson says, Kevin, we need you to get your blood test. So I, I go to my blood testing facility. If I had done this in Florida, I would have walked in. Mask or no mask, no big deal. Sat down. If the nurse had a mask, you probably would have maybe not. Who knows? And I would have got jabbed. They pulled the blood. Here, I have to sit in the parking lot, download the Yale Medical Medicine COVID app. And you download it. It says, text when you're here. Here, please wait in the parking lot 12 minutes. We will text you again when you should come to the front door. And I go to the front door and they they measure my forehead for the temperature. That's not good enough anymore. You're in Connecticut. We're going to measure your pulse for the temperature as well. Oh, gross. Okay, whatever. And finally, I go in, and I, I, there are little squares. You have to stand six feet apart. You go in, and then they to be sure you're not going to give them the COVID you don't have, they really wipe your arm down now with the, the alcohol. In Florida, I would have had a much different experience giving blood. All right. Probably. One of the things I love about my doctor in Florida is that he's fatter than I am, <laughs> and I'll come if I and I'll see him take cigarette breaks outside. So, so I have this huge fat man with little cigarette ashes down his front. I always feel healthy when I see him. I don't know. He's <laughs> he's coughing. He's coughing. He's got cholesterol so thick he snaps in half if he bends. And that makes me feel good. I want my doctor to be sicker than me, not sure. healthier. No, no, I, you know, I, I, I've hit. What is fifty-five? Is that my silver years? It's not the golden years, bronze years. I don't know. Whatever. So, uh, I got my my blood results back. I'm I'm good for another year. We'll see. George, we're now AARP card. 
Oh, they've been chasing me, George, but nah, they're a little bit too liberal for me. 15 minutes in, should we do a news story? Yeah, let's we've do got a news some story. Fun ones. Okay, if, if people don't Friends, know. Friends, we actually oh. had a list of 22. Yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> stories, we're not going to go through all 22. This is the 10th anniversary of Anglican Unscripted. June 12th, I think, is going to be the, 12th, the, the 10th anniversary. And yay for us. In that time, we've not done a lot of Canadian news stories. Uh, I think the, the fall of the Church of Canada happened about eight years ago, and we had a, a viewer who was actually sued by his bishop in Canada, and the church has really fallen in disrepair, disrepute. Um, and so we don't do a lot of reporting, but when a good story occurs, George has the story. And they have a bishop who discovered she probably shouldn't be talking on Twitter, George. Tell us the story. Oh, this is a wonderfully fun story. There's the Bishop-elect of British Columbia. That's sort of the mainland portion of the province of British Columbia, the backwater uh, around the Vancouver area. Vancouver itself is New Westminster. Well, they elected this woman priest named Anna Greenwood Lee, hyphen Greenwood Lee. And I've looked at her picture, and she's one of these women who they've done a very good job. So she could be anywhere from 35 to 75 years of age. So I don't know how old she is. Well, Bishop-elect Lee was elected in September, and will take office, I think, this month. And she decided to start taking to Twitter and let the world know what she thinks. Well, a Canadian political party, the United Conservative Party of Alberta, I believe, on Christmas Day, tweeted a passage from Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6. And for those of you who are Baptists, you know what I'm talking about. For us Episcopalians, that is, for unto us, a child is born, born. who is wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, all this. And that's all they wrote. They had a picture of a nativity scene, the, the passage from Isaiah 9-6, and then the United Conservative Party of, Can of, Cal of Alberta. This Bishop Greenwood Lee decided to express her righteous indignation. And she started off with this, how you sort of the, the clue that this is not a serious person. Her first words were, as a priest and bishop elect, I am outraged by this. In other words, she sets out her qualifications as if these and these alone, uh, you must bow to her skill and wisdom. And she basically said, this is terrible that this political party is claiming the mantle of organized religion for their political purposes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then she goes on to say, first, it's supersessionism, which is anti-Semitic. Ooh, you can't do that. Whenever, and I hear, here's what she wrote. Whenever Christians use the Hebrew scriptures and say it was just foreshadowing Jesus, this passage is likely about King Hezekiah in the 8th century BCE. They're being anti-Semitic. They're stealing the Hebrew scriptures and twisting them to prefigure Jesus Christ. No. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't know what to the say. New not, the, not even Catherine Jefford the, Shorey <laughs> went down that road. Oh, that's so funny. Catherine Jefford Shorey beat up on the Apostle Paul for mansplaining to the servant girl yeah. in Ephesus that, you know, he was going to deliver her from demons, and what right did he have to do that? This first, you know, supersessionism is a thing. It's when it's a you believe that God has walked away it's a form of marcionism where the old god of the old testament is a different god from the new testament mm -hmm. the jews had it all wrong it's what the nazi christian the deutsche kirche did the german christians you know yeah. we just forgetting the jewish origins we're pure new testament christians and we've replaced we're the new jews the old jews are all going to hell instead she's saying that Isaiah and all the prophecies and all the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John say point to the coming of Jesus. Refer to, yeah, prophecies. Absolutely. Sure. And all the things that Jesus says about himself. Well, Jesus was therefore being anti Semitic. He was being a Jew baiter uh, for 
colonizing and appropriating these things from the Hebrew scriptures. Now, I have a little thing about people who use BCE, before the Christian era, instead of BC. Sure. And, you know, finally I've stopped getting my back of my hairs when I read it in academic works. But for a bishop to go off on this. Well, I got, I went and I took this to some Canadian uh, the theologians. And they I can, all I can like, only think of like three or four. So just in your heads, people of, of knowledge, think of who he may be talking to. Okay, go on. <laughs> and I'll write this up in an article. But I have to do it in a certain way. And basically, I think, well, we've got to live with this person. So we can't say what we're talking about right now. But what we can say is, oh, my God, <laughs> what was she thinking? And one, one fellow said, this is the reason why bishops shouldn't be on Twitter. Because she probably remembered something somewhere. And then just because she's a priest and bishop elect, you now have to pay attention to her. Look at me! And, you know, it's just... The Diocese of British Columbia was under a uh, nosedive under its previous bishop. Sure. It just tanked. It's selling off churches, closing churches, amalgamating churches. People are running away in droves. And the former bishop, his response was, well, we just must not be liberal enough. We just need to continue doing more of what we're doing. And what did it do? It drove away more people. And so this diocese, when it elected a new bishop, elected somebody who will continue to drive away people. Why would you want to go to a church that preaches the Old Testament has nothing to do with the new? That all this stuff is just sort of colorful. Might as well, you know, go get the Egyptian Book of the Dead or Inca. Oh, please, I may be giving them ideas. I shouldn't yes, say anything I else. Like, wait, uh, <laughs> we can do that? You know, I mean, there's the reality. I mean, the, it's a church we don't report on much because it's a lost church. Um, it, I, at this point, take off the moniker church. The Anglican Church of Canada is not a church, and it certainly isn't Anglican. Uh, you're a bunch of uh, uh, righteous old people who like your titles. And that's all you, that's all you got left is your titles. Yeah. Yeah, here, I mean, you know, leadership does matter. It helps us the tone. It helps us the direction. And this diocese picks someone who will drive it further into the ground, mm -hmm. who is self-important, who is ignorant, and who doesn't have a Christian, cognizable Christian faith. You just have some sort of vague spirituality. Um, and what's in it for her? Because she's the bishop-elect. We should pay attention to her. We should. How are, and, you know, to, to really put an explanation mark on our, our point here, the Church of Canada doesn't release their numbers anymore. We don't know how many people attend. We don't know where they attend. We don't know what churches are left. We don't know how much money they have left. Um, they've just gone completely dark. And this is mm -hmm. a, a bishop taking to Twitter who has enjoyed that darkness. And I don't suspect they're going to be along too much longer. Uh, and we hear the same. We, we've heard from uh, the, the few remaining conservative uh, evangelical priests in the church. It's, it's gone. It's over. And so uh, we just got to wait for that, that death knell, foul nail in the, in the coffin moment. Um, let's see. We got some other stories. You had your list of 22. Uh, what, was the, what was the second one? <laughs> now, did, what, did we want to talk about the West Indies removing confirmation as a requirement for Holy Communion? Well, let's do that. Was because, that one? Or? No, let's do the confirmation one because that's an easy one. Uh, if you're an Anglican, you understand that uh, in the Rubik's, you need to be confirmed to get uh, Holy Communion. If you're Baptist, you probably don't. You just need that full immersion experience. If you're Roman Catholic, George, do you have to uh, have a, a confirmation? Of course. So that's been something that's been a standard for you know centuries. However, when I joined the Episcopal Church, there were many people who were not confirmed, and this is back in the, the early 90s, who were just popping and drinking, popping and drinking. Are you confirmed yet? Nah, nah. And the bishop, nah, don't be deal, no big deal. And it's just kind of a, a nod, nod, wink, wink. It's not that necessary, but it's in the Rubik's. It's in, you wrote it down somewhere that it needs to be done. 
and now they're going to deal with this in the West Indies, George. What's what's the story? It's been said uh, by liturgical scholars the confirmation is a rite in search of a meaning. Right. Uh, in the Anglican world, we, in the Catholic world, confirmation is one of the seven sacraments. In the Anglican world, we have two sacraments. Yes, for our Anglo viewers, Anglo Catholic viewers, there are five others, five. but I don't want to fight that fight. It's not it, but it was kept in the Anglican world and the uh, original prayer books. Uh, confirmation was kept as the gateway for Holy Communion. Uh, but then, being good Anglicans and Episcopalians, we essentially ignored it. There were no bishops in the United States in what became the United States for 200 years, where there are Anglicans here. And George Washington received Holy Communion as a boy, even though he was never confirmed. They gave it was ignored in principle, and it was only in the 19th century when we started getting bishops uh, that it became more and the with the return of the oxford movement right. did confirmation become before communion become the practical norm it was still the canonical requirement now fast forward to the liturgical movements of the 60s and 70s and starting with the scots in 78 and then the episcopal church in 79 the scots removed communion uh the confirmation as a requirement the 79 episcopal church prayer book is ambiguous it doesn't say yes, it doesn't say no, it could go both ways. Since then, uh, we've had the Anglican world moving away. And there's a lot of confusion. The Church of England, its prayer book still says you must, but dioceses uh, are allowed to opt out. And all but two dioceses, I think Sodder and Man and another one, uh, do not require confirmation before Holy Communion. Church of Kenya came up with a new prayer book in 2004. And this 2004 prayer book uh, has no confirmation right. But its canons, the Kenyan canyons, say that you have to have confirmation before communion, but the prayer book is now absent. So they're basically ignoring the canons. And in the West Indies, I've served as a priest in the West Indies, and the practice in the West Indies is anybody who wants to come can do it. Uh, who's been baptized and so the church of the the bishops of the church of the west indies a year ago said we're going to start the process and we're going to basically try to decide what is confirmation for and we're going to move towards eliminating it as the call what they call the gateway to holy communion now i had a liturgy professor named paul marshall who later became the bishop of bethlehem pennsylvania and he always said, you need confirmation because otherwise Episcopal bishops would have nothing to do. And he's basically right. Because That's right. <laughs> I, if, if we didn't have confirmation, I don't think my bishop would ever be in touch with me. I mean, he comes every two to three years. He confirms. And that's all he does. Um, but what, you know, so this whole battle... You know, it may be a minor minutiae point, but it really is the bigger issue. What is the episcopate for? Is it just, here's something for bishops to do every two to three years, visit your parish, confirm these kids, and then never see the kids again and never see the bishop until the next generation is ready? Or are the West Indi or are we looking for a role for the episcopate as a father of God, as a teacher, as a pastor, and I, I think this is the ongoing debate. What is, what is the role of the bishop? Because um, right now, uh, it's not very well articulated, and we're basically kicking out the, the canonical and liturgical underpinnings. Otherwise, all you need a bishop for is to make more clergy and more bishops. Yeah, I mean, that's we certainly take this uh, a little deeper than I thought we would. I thought we'd just talk about the... Uh, the communion part but that is reality i mean we have throughout the episcopal church and the communion people who are full-time bishops who aren't fulfilling the role as being the pastor's pastor uh now it's different uh, i know in our diocese uh, you're getting a call from the bishop almost you know once every two weeks and he's going to talk to you uh he's in, he's involved in your bible studies he's involved in your um, uh, your prayer life, and you are really, really, really accountable to him. 
Uh, it's just the way my diocese works. It, it, it's he's a, uh, a wonderful bishop, and uh, the priests talk about him all the time because he is their pastor. It's kind of cool. But you see, don't find that he, in the Episcopal. He he is yeah. actually on the cutting edge of what it means to be a bishop. Sure. Because the old model was the king in his castle who just did confirmations Sorry. and looked pretty every two or three years. Mm -hmm. Here's a bishop who's actually engaged in the faith life. He treats his clergy the way a priest treats members of his congregation. He's interested in them. He wants to know their children doing and all this and that. Most bishops, in my experience, have no interest whatsoever and are basically happy looking at the books and getting to dress up. I mean, it's, we talked about this Canadian bishop-elect. Which way do you think she's going to go down? Do you think she's going to genuinely care about the spiritual, moral, and pastoral welfare of her people? Or is she going to say, as a priest and bishop-elect, you must do X, Y, and Z? I know how she's going to sign her mail. <laughs> right, Reverend. So, I mean... It, it's just one of those things where, but I know the ACNA and other entities, certainly in uh, Africa, are reteaching what it means to be a bishop. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope that takes on. I hope the bishops relearn to be the, the pastor's pastor, um, the priest's priest, if you will. Um, it's so important, especially in this time. Uh, this COVID time has really drawn out the church to, to use all its resources and to come back together to learn what's important you know for the last 60 years america and the west has largely lost what is important especially with the church now we're kind of finding out those relationships are very important and if you haven't figured out the most essential organization on earth right now is the church uh keep listening because it, it really is you know We've been talking so long, Kevin, the sun came up. Oh my and gosh. I try to hold a clipboard up so I don't look half yellow, half orange. Oh, well, 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 okay, next story. Clip Come on. Is, we got 32 down, minutes in. Clip, clipboard up. All right. clip, clipboard up, clipboard down. Okay. okay. Uh, next uh, story. What do you got there, George? Oh, uh, Indian corruption? Or is, do you want to take a pass on that? Yeah. Um, well, it was finally announced that the. the uh, this was something that uh, Gavin Ashton was involved in, in the very beginning. The Channel Islands finally have passed to the Diocese of Salisbury uh, in the Church of England from the Diocese of Winchester to Salisbury. Mm -hmm. And this all started about, gosh, it's eight years now, where a crazy woman accused the dean uh, of some sort of imp sexual impropriety. And the bishop in Winchester, rather than doing due proper, diligence, yeah doing it properly, decided to make an example of the dean, and the dean was exonerated. And the bishop doubled down by holding a, uh, having a review con conducted by a judge, and then said, I'll publish the results of this review. Well, the results of the review, which has still not been made public, but which people who have read, who have talk seen it firsthand have told me, basically yeah, exoriates the bishop for being a stupid jackass and a son of a bitch. Uh, I don't think it was put in more ecclesiastical language. No, no, that, I think that's about it, you know. <laughs> that's about it. And the bishop did not want this released because it just made him look so bad. And things got so bad between the Bishop of Winchester and the deanery in Guernsey and Jersey and Aldershot, uh, Alderney that uh, they asked to be moved to another diocese. And Justin Welby got involved, and he put the former bishop, he put the Bishop of Dover, Trevor Wilmot, in charge pastorally. And now the, the House of Lords had a debate and passed an ecclesiastical law measure transferring jurisdiction of the Channel Islands from Winchester to Salisbury. And in the debate in the House of Lords, uh, one of the lords got up and said, yes, I think I'd like to pass this, but I want to put an amendment basically pointing out what a jackass the Bishop of Winchester is. They decided they debated that for a bit and said, well, eh, we don't really need that in the record. <laughs> but <laughs> If it's not obvious enough, we don't need to say it. Yeah. No, but this, this, this is a news item, but it also comes down to the theme of bad bishops. Uh, bishops who don't know how to do their job, who are so enamored with being bishops, who enjoy playing dress up. 
who have no pastoral skills whatsoever. Now, what does it take for a bishop to destroy a relationship of over 500 years uh, such that a whole area of your diocese wants to leave and join another diocese? And the thing is, this bishop in Winchester is considered a conservative evangelical. And the bishop of Salisbury is a liberal looney tune whose big stuff is the environment. They'd rather have the greeny weeny bishop than the theologically proper bishop because the theologically proper bishop is a horrible human being and priest. So. I don't know if 2021 is going to be any better than 2020, George. I just, you know, um, it's just good, good, good employment for you and I as journalists. But uh, I, I got to say, um, thank God <laughs> there's hope in Christ. Uh, all right. So are we out of stories? You got all the no, ones, I got huh? 20 others, but, you know, yeah. do you really want to hear about Cape Coast, ordains first woman priest? Uh, That's all news. see. Well, here, here's, um, what we, here's what viewers need to do, okay? Uh, I'm assuming what, you were asking for donations before, George. Mm -hmm. I want every viewer to donate to Anglican TV and Anglican Scripted. And you do that by donating your likes. Okay. Isn't that a cool? How it made that transition? You're not listening to that. You can oh, donate a like. I, <laughs> okay. I had scrolled past the top story on my list. Oh no! What is it? The ever the Tanzanian priest jailed for twenty years for ivory poaching. I didn't know that. What's the uh, story? Police. Oh, uh, they're getting serious. Uh, uh, poaching it, you know, is destroying. Uh, elephants in the wild sure. are basically disappearing in Tanzania. Yeah. They're essentially only in the uh, preserves. Great Massimo Game Reserve, the big game parks up in the north. In the rest of the country, elephants in the bush are basically being killed by poachers. And they and it's not, you know, villagers going out and catching an elephant. It's it's people in helicopters or in land cruisers driving around, running them to the ground and killing them and cutting off their tusks and leaving the bodies to rot. And uh, the, so the Tanzanian government, with backing from various NGOs and uh, British and American government, has been cracking down on ivory poaching because there's a huge market for it in China. And China basically allows, you know, they have no questions asked about poaching of, of uh, exotic uh, species, endangered species. Well, a priest in the diocese of Mwapwa, uh, I'm not stuttering, it's actually MWP. A M P A Mwapwa, uh -huh. which is in central Tanzania in the Dodoma area. Police raided his home after a tip off and they found uh, two ivory tusks of a bull elephant. Wow. And he was jailed and he was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. And that wasn't an exemplary uh, sentence. Uh, there was another case in the northern part of the country where some policemen were jailed, given 25 year sentences. To, um, because they are really serious about cutting down on poaching because tourism, uh, you and I have been to Tanzania, Kevin, and sure. tourism, there's not much there. There's I not. Mean, there's, it, it, it's big when you can get it, but, you know, you, your, your tour guide is the local taxi driver, you know. And so the, the game parks and the safari parks are m major forms of, uh, major sources of income and they, the governments have gotten the idea that they have to protect and preserve uh, their natural resources, just as you protect water and your forests and things of that nature. And so they're really being serious uh, in jailing these people. Which is are, good. I mean, initially when they started banning ivory, it really increased the demand for ivory. Uh, you know, it's a mm -hmm. supply and demand thing, and that kind of backfired. What they really, really need to do is really come down hard on the poachers. And that, if that's a life sentence in prison, that's a life sentence in prison. Yeah. You know, well, 20 years in a Tanzanian jail is a life sentence because you're not going to make it. No. But, but there are two countries. Zimbabwe has these laws, but uh, money talks in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually pay the Zimbabwe Air Force to charter a helicopter and go hunt uh, elephants in state, in, in state wildlife reserves. That's Zimbabwe for you. 
And South Africa has commercial game parks where uh, exactly. corporations own these lands and actually breed up, just like you go to Texas for quail shooting or uh, deer hunting and things like that. They run the same sort of enterprises where they uh, basically breed and uh, these animals for sport. Hmm. Um, I'm not speaking now of the ethics <clears throat> of hunting, but I'm talking about the situation in the rest of Africa where the forest elephant is just about to disappear. The elephants of West Africa are just about all gone. And it's just in the East Africa and South Africa that you have any pockets left. Um, you know, one of the things that the, the, the warring rebels would do in Rwanda is they'd kill the, they kill gorillas because the body parts, the Chinese turn into medicine and things of that nature. And so a priest got caught up on the wrong side of uh, this issue, and now his life's over. Wow. Let that be a lesson, I hope. All right, so let's finish out the program here. To do so, I want you guys to donate to Anglican Scripted and Anglican TV. Do you, you do that by donating your likes. Every person who watched this episode, if you click the like button, you've donated a like to us, and we really appreciate that because that tells Facebook and it tells YouTube that this program is special. Not George and I, but the program that you watch every week uh, is special, and they need to promote it. It's really free advertising. Please go to the comments if you want to continue the discussion on bishops. That's a great way to uh, do it, because I know lots of people are going to say, how many sacraments there really are? <laughs> That's going to be the comment section. Uh, no, it, it's it's more than one, less than ten. And, and no, we're not in favor of ivory uh, no. hunting elephants. That's okay. not... Okay. No, nope. love my elephants. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 638 of Anglican Unscripted.